the General Assembly. Mr. President, Secretary General, Excellencies, President, ladies and gentlemen, Secretary General, I'm honored to address the United Nations General Assembly once again. I congratulate His once again. Mr. I congratulate His Excellency Mr. Volkan Bosker on his election session. as the President of the 75th Session of the General Assembly. We also appreciate the skillful leadership of the outgoing President, His Excellency Tijani Mohammed Bande, especially during the COVID-19 crisis. We commend the leadership of the Secretary General in these extremely turbulent times. Mr. President, since my government assumed office, our consistent effort has been to fundamentally transform Pakistan. We envisage Nia Pakistan to be modeled on the principles of the state of Medina, established by Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A just and humane society where all government policies are directed at lifting our citizens out of poverty and creating a just and equitable dispensation. To achieve this goal, we need to have peace and stability. Thus, a foreign policy aims to have peace with our neighbors and settle disputes through dialogue. Mr. President, the 75th anniversary of the United Nations is an extremely important milestone as this is the only body in the world that can help us achieve our goals of peace and stability in our neighborhood. This is also time for us to reflect whether as the United Nations we have been able to realize the promise we collectively made to our peoples. Today, the foundations of the world order, non-use of or threat of unilateral force, self-determination of peoples, the sovereign equality and territorial integrity of states, non-interference in the internal affairs, international cooperation, all these ideals are being systematically eroded. International agreements are being flouted and set aside. Renewed great power rivalries are leading to a new arms race. Conflicts are proliferating and intensifying. Military occupation, illegal annexations are suppressing the rights of human beings to self-determination. According to the respected professor Noam Chomsky, mankind is at even a greater risk than it was before the first and second world wars in the last century. And this is because of the threat, increased threat of nuclear war, climate change, and sadly the rise of authoritarian regimes. We must come together to prevent such a catastrophe. We believe that the driving force in international relation must be cooperation in accordance with the principles of international law and not confrontation and force. We all must emphatically reaffirm our support for multilateralism. Mr. President, the COVID-19 pandemic has illustrated the oneness of humanity. In our interconnected world, no one is safe unless everyone is safe. Locking down to control the pandemic has triggered the worst recession since the Great Recession of the last century. This has hit the poorest countries the hardest, as well as the poor in all the countries. In Pakistan, we realized very early on that if we imposed a strict lockdown, the type that several affluent countries had imposed, we would have more people dying of hunger than the virus. Therefore, we adopted a policy of smart lockdown. While concentrating on the hot spots, the virus hot spots, we opened up our agriculture sector immediately and then followed it up by the construction sector which, which employed most of the people. At the same time, 
and this is despite financial constraints. My government deployed $8 billion unprecedented amount for our health services plus support the poorest and most vulnerable households with direct cash payments through SAS program and then subsidies to the small businesses. Even though our smart lockdown was heavily criticized in the beginning but thanks to the almighty Allah's grace we have not only managed to control the virus stabilize our economy but most importantly we have been able to protect the poorest segment of the society from the worst fallout of the lockdown. Today, Pakistan's response is cited among the success stories in controlling and responding to the pandemic. However, we are still not out of the woods, like no country is out of the woods today. But Mr. President, it was obvious from the outset that developing countries would need fiscal space to respond to and recover from the COVID crisis. Debt relief is one of the best ways to create that fiscal space for developing countries. Therefore, in early April, I called for a global initiative on debt relief. We appreciate the G20's official debt suspension in initiative and the emergency and rapid financing offered by the IMF, World Bank, Asian Development Bank and UN agencies. This, however, is not going to be enough. The IMF has estimated that developing countries will need over $2.5 trillion to respond and recover from the crisis. The official debt suspension will need to be extended and expanded. Additional debt relief measures will also be needed. Development banks should ensure adequate financial inflows. Rich countries have generated over $10 trillion to finance their own response and recovery they should support the creation of at least 500 billion in new special drawing rights for the developing world. Mr. President, in my address to the General Assembly last year, I had highlighted the tremendous damage that illicit financial flows from developing countries to rich countries and to offshore tax havens cause. This, this leads to the impoverishment of the developing nations. Money that could be used towards human development is siphoned off by corrupt elites. The loss of foreign exchange causes currency depreciation. That in turn leads to inflation and poverty. The quest for getting back these stolen resources is nearly impossible given the cumbersome procedures. Moreover, the powerful money launderers have access to the best lawyers. And sadly, because they are the beneficiaries, there is a lack of political will in the rich countries to curb this criminal activity. Mr. President, if this phenomena is unaddressed, it will continue to accentuate the inequality between the rich and the poor nations and eventually will spark off a bigger global crisis, a far bigger global crisis than the present migration issue poses. The rich states cannot hold forth on human rights and justice when they provide sanctuary to money launderers, to their looted wealth. There are, there are robust anti-money laundering and anti-terror financing regimes. I call upon this assembly to take the lead in efforts to build a global framework to stem the illicit financial flows and ensure speedy repatriation of stolen wealth. It is important to realize that the aid that flows from the aid that flows from rich countries to the developing world is minuscule compared to the massive outflows by our corrupt elites. Mr. President, this year I must again reiterate the threat posed to mankind due to climate change. Unprecedented fires in Australia, Siberia, California, 
Brazil, unprecedented floodings in various parts of the world, record temperatures, even in the Arctic Circle. This should make all of us worried for our future generations. Commitments made through the Paris Agreements must be fulfilled. In particular, the commitment to mobilize 100 billion US dollars annually as climate finance. Pakistan's contribution to carbon emissions is minimal, but it is one of those countries most affected by climate change. Yet, we have decided to take the lead as we consider addressing climate change a universal responsibility. We have launched an extremely ambitious program to plant 10 billion trees in the next three years as a contribution to mitigating the effects of climate change. Mr. President, the pandemic was an opportunity to bring humanity together. Unfortunately, it has instead fanned nationalism, increased global tensions, and given rise to racial and religious hatred and violence against vulnerable minorities in several places. These trends have also accentuated Islamophobia. Muslims continue to be targeted with impunity in many countries. Our shrines are being destroyed. Our Prophet Muhammad wasallam insulted. The Holy Quran burnt. And all this in the name of freedom of speech. Incidents in Europe including republication of blasphemous sketches by Charlie Hebdo are recent examples. We stress that willful provocations and incitement to hate and violence must be universally outlawed. This assembly should declare an international day to combat Islamophobia and build a coalition to fight the scourge, scourge that splits humanity. Mr. President, the one country in the world today where I'm sad to say the state sponsors Islamophobia, and that is India. The reason behind this is the RSS ideology that unfortunately rules India today. This extremist ideology was founded in the 1920s. The RSS founding fathers were inspired by the Nazis, and they adopted their concepts of racial purity and supremacy. While the Nazis' hate was directed at the Jews, the RSS directs it towards the Muslims and to a lesser extent, the Christians. They believe that India is exclusively for Hindus and others are not equal citizens. The secularism of Gandhi and Nehru has been replaced by the dream of creating a Hindu Rashtra by subjugating even cleansing India's 200 million Muslims and other minorities. In 1992, the RS destroyed the Babri Masjid. In 2002, some 2,000 Muslims were slaughtered in Gujarat. And this was under the watch of Chief Minister Modi. In 2007, over 50 Muslims were burnt alive by RSS arsonists abroad the Samjota Express train. In Assam, around 2 million Muslims faced the prospects of being arbitrarily stripped of their nationality through the adoption of discriminatory laws. There are reports of large concentration camps being filled by Muslim Indian citizens. Muslims were falsely blamed, vilified and victimized for spreading the coronavirus. They were denied medical attention on many occasions. Their, bu their businesses were boycotted. Cow vigilantes attack and kill Muslims with impunity. Last February, Muslims faced targeted killings with police complicity in New Delhi. Mass registrations in the past have often been a precursor to genocide. For example, the Nuremberg Laws in Germany in 1935 and then in 1982 in Myanmar. 
the hindutva ideology is said to marginalize almost 300 million human beings muslims christians and sikhs this is unprecedented in history and this does not augur well for the future of india as we all know that marginalization of human beings leads to their radicalization <clears throat> mr president for over 72 years india has illegally occupied jammu and kashmir against the wishes of the kashmiri people and in blatant violation of the resolutions of the security council and indeed its own commitments to the people of kashmir on 5th august last year india illegally and unilaterally sought to change the status of the occupied territories and deployed additional troops bringing the total number to 900000 to impose a military siege on 8 million kashmiris all K kashmiri political leaders were incarcerated about 13000 kashmiri youth were abducted and thousands tortured a complete curfew was imposed accompanied by a total communications blackout indian occupation forces have used brute force including pellet guns against peaceful protesters imposed collective punishments including the destruction of entire neighborhoods and extra judicially murdered hundreds of innocent young kashmiris in fake encounters refusing even to hand over their bodies for burial the kashmiri media and those daring to raise their voice are being systematically harassed and intimidated through the use of draconian laws all of this is well documented in the reports of the united nations high commissioner for human rights communications from the special rapporteurs of human rights council statements from human rights and civil society organizations the international community must investigate these grave violations and prosecute the indian civil and military personnel involved in state terrorism and serious crimes against humanity being perpetrated i'm sad to say with complete impunity the objective of this brutal campaign is to impose what the rss bjp regime has itself called the final solution for jammu and kashmir to this end the military siege is being followed by moves to change the, the demographic structure of the occupied territory This is an attempt to obliterate the distinct Kashmiri identity in order to affect the outcome of a plebiscite envisaged in the UN Security Council resolutions. This action is in violation of the UN Charter, Council resolutions and international law, particularly the 4th Geneva Convention changing demographic structure of occupied territory is a war crime mr president the brave kashmiri people will never submit to indian occupation and oppression their struggle is indigenous they are fighting for a just cause and generation after generation have laid down their lives to rid themselves of indian occupation the government and people of pakistan are committed to standing by and supporting the kashmiri brothers and sisters in the legitimate struggle for self determination mr president in order to divert attention from its illegal actions and atrocities in indian occupied jammu and kashmir india is playing a dangerous game of upping the military ante against pakistan in a nuclearized environment Despite constant Indian provocations and ceasefire violations along the line of control and the working boundary targeting innocent civilians Pakistan has exercised maximum restraint we have consistently sensitized the world community about a false flag operation and another ill conceived misadventure by India my parents mr president were born in the colonial india 
and I was the first generation that grew up in an independent Pakistan. I want to make it clear that any attempt by the fascist, totalitarian, RSS-led Indian government to aggress against Pakistan will be met by a nation that, uh, that will fight for its freedom to the end. Mr. President, there will be no durable peace and stability in South Asia until the Jammu and Kashmir dispute is resolved on the basis of international legitimacy. Kashmir has been rightly described as a nuclear flashpoint. The Security Council must prevent a disaster conflict and secure the implementation of its own resolutions as it did in the case of East Timor. The Council has considered the situation in Jammu and Kashmir three times in the past year. It must take appropriate enforcement actions. It, it must also take steps to protect the Kashmiris from an impending genocide by India. Pakistan has always called for a peaceful solution. To this end, India must ascend. To reach this end, India must ascend the measures it has instituted since 5th August 2019, end its military siege and other gross human rights violation, and agree to resolve the Jammu and Kashmir dispute in accordance with the relevant UN Security Council resolutions, and of course, the wishes of the people of Kashmir. Mr. President, Pakistan's desire for peace in our region is also manifest in our efforts to promote a political solution in Afghanistan. I have consistently maintained over the past two decades that there is no military solution to the conflict in Afghanistan. The only way forward was and is a political settlement which involves the full spectrum of Afghanistan's political actors. Pakistan fully facilitated the process that culminated in the U.S.-Taliban peace agreement on 29 February 2020. Pakistan is deeply gratified that it has fulfilled its part of the responsibility. The Afghan leaders must now seize this historic opportunity to achieve reconciliation and restore peace in the war-torn war country. Through the intra-Afghan negotiations that commenced on 12th of September, they must work out an inclusive, broad-based and comprehensive political settlement. The process must be Afghan-led and Afghan-owned, and without any interference or outside influence. Early return of Afghan refugees must be part of this, this political solution. After almost two decades of war, it is imperative not to allow spoilers within and outside Afghanistan to subvert the peace process. Peace and stability in Afghanistan will open new opportunities for development and regional connectivity. Mr. President, Palestine remains a festering wound. A just and lasting settlement is indispensable for the Middle East and actually the world. Illegal annexations of Palestinian territory, the building of illegal settlements and the imposition of inhuman living conditions on the Palestinian people, especially in Gaza, cannot bring peace to a troubled region. Pakistan continues to support a two-state solution in line with the UN General Assembly and Security Council resolutions within the international agreed parameters and their pre-1967 borders and Al-Quds Al-Sharif as the capital of a united, contiguous and independent Palestinian state. Mr. President, the United Nations remains the best legitimate avenue for collective action in managing international conflicts, fostering peace and security, promoting equitable development and addressing global problems. I urge the Secretary General to take the lead in preventing global conflicts. He should convene summit-level meetings to address regional hotspots 
and resolve outstanding disputes. The United Nations should be made fully responsive to the challenges of our times. A comprehensive reform of the United Nations, including the Security Council, is essential to promote greater democracy, accountability, transparency and efficiency. Pakistan will continue to participate actively in this process and endeavor with other member states to build a world where conflict is outlawed and equitable prosperity for all pursued in conditions of peace and security. I thank you. وزیر اعظم عمران خان اقوام متحدہ کی جنرل اسمبلی کے